Hello, everyone. Welcome back to season seven of the Erasing Shame podcast. I'm Victoria Chang, your co host for Encouraging Christian Asian Mental Health. Today, I'm here with DJ Chuang, and I'm also here with a special guest. Her name is Midori. Um, Midori, can you introduce yourself to us? Um, just a little bit of a background about how you heard about the podcast and um, yeah. Totally. Hi, I'm Midori, Midori Dumani. Um, I found out about the podcast because I get like weekly emails. And so I stumbled upon this one and I love the idea of erasing shame. Mm -hmm. My background is I'm half Mexican and half Japanese. And so I've been raised culturally more Japanese than Mexican. And I feel like I get to experience the a racing of shame through this, through like just living life and being, I don't ethnically necessarily look Asian presenting. Um, like when you first meet me, I often get the question like, so like, what are you? Or like, where are your parents from kind of thing? Um, or my name, obviously, if you're familiar, gives it away pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I've been presented with the lifetime of the opportunity of like how to navigate those conversations and be confident in who I am and be okay with like not necessarily like fitting in in every in the different people groups that exist and also to not bring any of like the shame to my children so my husband is half Lebanese half black so my children are Mexican Japanese Lebanese and black and so how to allow them to be confident in who they are and all their different ethnicities and all their different cultures that they embody. Um, because my husband was raised culturally Middle Eastern, although he presents um, as a black person. So it just is, I love the idea of this podcast of how do we acknowledge what it is and not, you know, have it influence the next generation in a negative way, but how to you know, take a step back and present it to our kids in the positive way so that they don't all have to carry the shame with them that my husband and I individually carried as kids and into our adult life. Um, how did you meet your husband? And um, did you, um, I guess him where, like, did you ask, like, where are you from? Or, cause I know like we, you, if you're, um, ethnically what what do people there's a phrase for it ethnically ambiguous people yeah. will say <laughs> I have friends who are ethnically ambiguous they look they're Chinese but people think they're Filipino or something else um, yeah is that something that just as you became friends you discussed or um, uh, yeah so I what also drew me to your guys's podcast specifically was that it was Christian mental health because my, my husband was raised Muslim and then converted to Christianity. So that oh, wow. in and of itself creates um, just a lot of different dynamics. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so, but we met at church before okay. he converted to Christianity. We were in the process at our church of purchasing our building and he was in real estate. And so oh. he had been coming to our church and someone was like, you should ask so-and-so, his name's, we, uh, his name's Tyre, Josh, Tyre Joshua Jumani. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, great. And his name presented like something. I was like, well, you're definitely not just black. So, mm -hmm. and because I'm culturally ambiguous or like I present ambiguous, I mm -hmm. probably feel too comfortable just asking like, oh, where are you from? Or like, what's, yeah, your, name? Yeah. what's your name mean? Because I yeah. often get that question. And I, and for me personally, I'd rather people just ask rather than like assume. assume or just try and like figure it out later. Like if they're curious, I'm totally fine to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it actually just happened yesterday. A girl came to our baby shower because we're due in two and a half weeks with our third girl. And she just texted me like on the way to the baby shower. She's like, so are you Japanese by chance? I was like, yeah, I am. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> but so we met at church and he helped us buy our building. And so just inevitably, I was on like our team that was buying our building. And so mm. we naturally just started um, working together a lot. And then 
we started like hanging out and dating and then we got engaged six months later and then married six months after that Wow! after he converted to Christianity. But yeah. Wow. So he, he was from a Muslim background, but he was helping with the buying of the new church building. Yeah. Cause he had, oh, wow. I mean, he said like a certain expertise and he, um, was trying I would say that he was like searching spirituality, like mm. he open was to... open to like, he was like researching Scientology and just like different avenues of religion and like what else is out there. Mm -hmm. um, and one of his friends brought him to church one Sunday. And so it opened up the door to Christianity. And then from there, yeah, he just got involved. <laughs> yeah. And now you guys have um how many kids did you say so we have two little girls now five and two and then we have another little girl coming and we're due in like less than 20 days so less oh, oh my goodness weeks. thank yeah. you so much for coming on the podcast <laughs> of course we, yeah all worked out fully pregnant <laughs> <laughs> of course oh, cool cool um so one of the questions that dj likes to ask us um is well, DJ, would you like to ask the question? <laughs> sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, what comes to mind when you hear the word shame? Uh, that literally, like, what, like, it just kind of is like icky. Mm. Like, um, when I hear shame, I probably resonate with it more than I would like to. Mm. Like, when I hear it, I'm like, oh, yeah, like, I probably make decisions based out of like a core belief or subconscious of shame. And then working myself like to a place of a neutral so that I could actually step into like how to respond to a question or how to engage in a conversation. Sometimes I hear it and it, it puts me in like a, like yeah. not a negative space, but like, I'm like, oh yeah, that's like what I'm, that's what I'm feeling right now is like shame. And I think it sorry my children are helping me that's so normal that's so okay normal. um like that probably that was probably i probably felt like an overwhelming sense of shame like oh they shouldn't be yelling mm -hmm. and you can obviously hear them um but yeah i think unfortunately just like sets me in like a negative place and then i just acknowledge what it is and try and get to a neutral place so yeah like i said like i probably just resonate with it more than i would like to mm -hmm. Yeah, very what, simply, yeah. it's a painful feeling. Yeah. <laughs> and so could you describe how you um, attend to it and then start to move yourself out of that painful yeah. moment? Um, I think before when I probably, before when I wasn't able to put a name to what I was feeling, I would just shut down and remove myself mentally, emotionally, physically from whatever situation was creating this painful moment. And then as I processed through pain, I realized what I was experiencing. And then I would just like remove myself, but stay in position so that I could re-engage with the conversation or whatever was happening around me if it felt like it was a safe space to exist. Mm. So I think so now, oh, go ahead. No, keep going. So I think now for me, I like acknowledge that it's painful and push through the pain in terms of like, it's, it's real. Like the pain is real and it doesn't need to define the next step of my future. Mm. That's a healthy growth that you've had in expressing, recognizing, feeling shame. Um, my question following that is, you seem to heavily resonate with the feeling of shame. Um, and is there uh, a specific reason or is that how you grew up? Um, or was there an event that kind of makes that feeling so strong for you presently or in the past and then you've had to work through it? Yeah, great question. Uh, yes, there was an, so when I was little, I was, my family's of my mom's side of the family is very close. Like she's one of three sisters or one of four sisters. 
and we did like we do, or, well, we did everything together. Like we were at my grandparents' house every, on, you know, on the weekends. And then we did all the traditional Japanese holidays. We celebrated together. Um, and like, there was only, so I have an older brother and a little sister and my aunt has two sons. So that we're pretty like small, like comparatively, mm. like my grandpa's one of eight. And so like, they have like a massive family. So we're pretty small in comparison. So we did lots of things together and we are very close with my cousins. And so there was obviously lots of trust built there. And so I would often sleep, sleep over at my cousin's house, even though he was male. And when he raped me and that I, what I didn't realize in the moment would be like such a traumatic event until like 10 years later, because it was like such a, short amount of time in comparison to like all the great times that we've had collectively as a family. Mm. And so I didn't say anything to anybody for 10 years because I didn't want to ruin, like I didn't want to like ruin the family dynamics that we had at play. Like, Cause I knew that like, I knew that it would cause like, I knew that our routine of what I knew family to be and what I love family to be would shift and like would change. Mm. And I, found myself more concerned with not changing the family dynamic than taking care of myself because I didn't realize like the longevity of the trauma that it was and that it is. And so when I was in my early twenties, I was at the same church that I met my husband at and I had a woman ask me, she's like, so why do you think you like party and like, drink so much and like do all these things and I was like because it's like what people do and she's like usually there's like an underlying tension there that you're trying to escape from and I just casually like said well I was right by my cousin when I was little but I don't think it really affects me and as I like said it I remember feeling like oh it definitely does affect me and I should definitely try and do something about this so I sought out actually an Asian Christian counselor to help process me through this because I I wanted to find someone who could help me process through like the shame because the next thing she asked was like, so what feeling do you think you feel? I was like, I feel embarrassed. She's like, well, that's mm. like a derivative of shame. And I was like, she's like, but you shouldn't be feel shameful about this. Like this isn't Absolutely your fault. Not. Absolutely and not. And so I sought out this specific counselor and went to him for years and he helped me through like a lot of the minutia of just like breaking it even down so that I could actually get to a place of like, it was months of just finally breaking my, breaking me down to like get to a place of neutral that I could actually have a like conversation that to get me out of like the negative space that I was in because I filtered so much of my teenage and twenties through like this feeling that I just chose not to acknowledge Mm -hmm. was affecting like my everyday decisions. Wow. I'm so sorry to hear that, but thank you for being so brave to share that publicly. And also, um, I'm glad that you were able to find a way to process it. Um, And when you're young, you clearly you cared so much about your family and we have as Asians we carry that honor for our family and we love our families generally and so (laughs) to I mean I I can't speak for everyone but (laughs) at least for for you here for me for DJ I can assume that we presently love our families very much and so to disrupt the dynamic at such a young age even though you were so young you understood that something would change if you spoke up which makes it harder to speak up because you're like, is it, is it going to be my fault if things become different? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so you were just in a survival mode for so long without necessarily being able to address it because of that shame slash embarrassment. Um, But I'm glad that the counselor pointed out to you, it's not your fault. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the 
the interesting thing about shame specifically is that it's so generationally, I believe, like embedded in, in Asian culture that it's like the natural like reaction to things. I remember mm-hmm. going to counseling with my husband, Joshua, and myself when we first got married and our counselor, um, we, we try and always find a Christian, Asian, uh, culturally um, counselor, not necessarily Asian, but like just non-white, I guess. Is they, they're say. equipped to yeah. understand the experience of what it's like to be a minority. Exactly. Yeah. But not like polarizing on like one side or the other. Right. And so he broke down like the cultural, like quadrants of like what it looks like for each like different culture. He said white Americans generally make decisions based out of guilt. Uh, Hispanic Americans generally make decisions based out of like guilt also because of like their religion and then Asians make decisions based out of shame. And those are the only two I really like stood out to me. There's two more, but I never can remember them. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting that like, even in my, even in our marriage, like we're both probably making decisions based out of the subconscious of shame Mm -hmm. because of all the different things that we live through. And because it's just culturally, like probably how our grandparents and our parents. Yeah. And it was modeled. And so it'll just, it's in your DNA. It's in yeah. your, how you're raised. And so you just act accordingly. Yeah. Like what I, like my grandpa's like my hero, like my dad, my mom's dad, he's like, like, he's just my favorite person. And he still is. And I remember being like, oh, I know if I tell Papa, he's for sure going to like take my side. Like I'm the first granddaughter, like I'm for, and uh, I remember we were walking in his beautiful, like garden, his beautiful garden that he created here and I was like oh I know exactly how he's going to support me it's going to be like yeah let's do whatever you need to do and like be super supportive and I was I think I was most heartbroken by like his response than like the Mm -hmm. actual event of it because he's like he is my hero Mm -hmm. and I remember him being like but you're Japanese like come on like you're going to be okay like you're going to push through I was like oh I am going to be okay and I am okay, but I also just want you to acknowledge that it's like painful. And he was like, oh, it's painful still. Yeah. And I remember him being like, but you're strong and you're going to be fine. And you're, and this is before I had kids or I was even married. Mm. He's like, your kids are going to be fine. He's like, and just, if you say anything, he's, He's talking about my cousin now. He's like, yeah. he will not be okay if you say anything. And I was like, oh, I'm very concerned with like, he's not capable of being okay. And I'm capable of being okay. So I get to like push through this in this way. And you that, have to deal with that. Yeah. And so I think that was like, that to me was way more painful than like anything else in the process. Like his response and my mom's response, but that was like, but, and now stepping back, my, my counselor at the time was like, he said to me, he's like, people only know how to do like, what did he say? He said something like, they only know how to do what they like know what to do. Like they're doing the best they can with what they have. Like this is, mm. this is a new situation for them because he was more concerned about me not carrying like anger and bitterness to them. Mm. And having a space of like forgiveness for my own heart and for my own head. And so for me to move forward, he's like, I don't want this to come you to move forward with a bitter heart from here, even though it's so painful. Mm. And so, but it was, yeah, it was like crazy. But I'm looking back now, like I probably told them two years after I started processing it and looking back now, I'm actually, it actually gave me like a different lens of grace for my grandpa to be like, you, you probably feel so much more shame than I do because this is your grandson that you thought would never do this. And he did the like unthinkable and the thing that you can't actually do anything about. Hmm. And so it allows me to have a different space of like 
grace and understanding for my grandpa to be like, because they're of the generation where like you just like push through everything, like everything, everything's going to be fine. And like, I can't even imagine the immense amount of shame that he feels from this being his bloodline, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The reactions sometimes are worse because especially from the people you care about to be in your corner, to be championing you. And yes, there's the nuance where your parents, your grandparents, whoever is your caretaker who came before you only knows so much about how to deal with the situation. But it's just so heartbreaking. In that moment, you expected uh, a support and a space for you to be recognized in your grief. But he himself didn't have that space to meet his own shame, right? And so then they just encourage you to fight through it, right? To just survive. But in that moment, I wish for you or for anybody that whoever we're confiding in will give us that space. If if someone came, if your child, I guess, told you something similar happened to them, what would your response be um, so that you're not putting the onus on them to get better, to be stronger. Yeah, and I hope it never happens. And never, <laughs> never, God forbid. Right. And my first response is, I believe you. Mm. Like, I believe you. Like, regardless of what transpired, is I believe you. And like, let's start there mm. and work through where, like, what what do you need? Like, I believe mm. you. And, do you I'm think sorry. <laughs> like that yeah. like how do I extract the information out of you in such a way that it's gracefully pulled through so that you act so she can actually re like release it, you know? And I mean, they're kids, right? It's so, like we actually have like our best friends live across the street and we um they're two boys and we I have two girls and they play and one time they were like playing doctor. So like, and it's innocent, right? But she came, I came downstairs and she like had her little night out. I was like, what are you, or what is happening down here? And uh, they were like, well, we are playing doctor because I'm obviously having a child. So I bring my, my daughter with me to the gynecologist so she could just be homeschool her. So I expose her to different things from a learning standpoint. And she was like, it's like what your doctor did. And I'm like, I get it. And we don't do this outside of the doctor's office. Oh. And I get it. And mm -hmm. so we sat all four of them down. Mm -hmm. Even my two year old probably didn't need to be a part of the car, but just to like play the playing field. Like, this is what we don't do. Mm -hmm. And, but it was interesting because as soon as I came downstairs, my daughter instantly like pulled her little thing down. She's like, we're not doing anything. And so oh. you, I immediately was like, you feel shameful about what you what you just did. So how do I like graciously enter this conversation so you don't cover up what actually happened so we can actually work through mm. um like what's what's not okay here and what's not your fault. Mm. You know, because it's like a balance of like and her immediate reaction was like like it was just so cold like we're not doing anything. It's like, we well, clearly we're doing something and it's okay. And let's just talk through it all. And like I said, they're our best friends. So it's easier to have that open conversation of like, this is what how we treat people and this is what we do and what we don't do. Mm -hmm. And so that was like too close for comfort in my level. So now we have like very strict boundaries with mm -hmm. everything and they've been really all of them have been obviously super receptive. And if it ever happened to my daughter, my first response is going to be like, I believe you. And where do we go from here? Yeah. To create a space where she can be fully vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I might, like, I hope she would feel safe to be fully vulnerable so that we can actually work from the ground up rather than from a place where I don't have all the information to even 
take a step forward or I'm taking a step forward and I only have 30% of the information, which doesn't help her in the long run. Yeah. And I'm sorry to like, have you even have to imagine that that's a possibility as girls. I mean, it can happen to you guys as well, but it's more common with girls. But um, yeah, I guess I kind of wanted to ask that question um, to, cause you can't go back in time, right? Um, but you can um, teach your children uh, how you would experience emotions and things like that. So we can't change the past, but we can change our families, hopefully legacies, futures, and equip them with more emotional tools, which is what you're doing for them. So I applaud you for that. I want to be that kind of mom. <laughs> if I ever find myself in that situation, I feel like you handle it with so much grace. Yeah. Um, DJ, do you have any comments, any questions for Midori? Oh, there, there's so much you've experienced <laughs> in life and I Great. appreciate you sharing the painful moments and uh, how you made some bold steps of courage towards healing instead of just surviving. Um, the probably the first big decision was what would happen when you spoke up about the violation to your body as you sought healing, whether privately or quiet, uh, privately, quietly, or more publicly. Um, how long did that healing process take? In addition to counseling, was faith a factor? And then I have a second question after you answer this one. Yeah. So how long? Can you repeat it again? How long was your healing process? And did faith, uh, your Christian yes. faith help uh, alongside of your counseling? Because you mentioned counseling. Yeah, I would say it's, I would say it's a healing journey that I get to process probably for the rest of my life mm -hmm. in different facets and degrees. Cause I think there's going to be things in my life that I experience that I've never experienced before. And that sensitive moment gets triggered and um, like it just happened actually recently. Um, my sister, who's like my, who is my best friend had a baby and my mom lives with us and she's lived with us since before my first daughter was born. And my mom was like, I'm going to go stay with her for six weeks. Cause she just had a baby, which is reasonable, like <laughs> makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was being abandoned and I felt mm -hmm. like it was like an attack on me. And I was very angry at my mom and when her and I sat down well sounds like really we cordially sat down and had a conversation it wasn't like that I was like very angry so I just and she listened to me so I we had like a very intense conversation and the first thing that came out of my mouth was like you're banning me the, the you're not supporting me in the same way you did support me when I told you about my cousin and I was mm. like oh my goodness like I thought that we were through with this. Like I thought that like I was healed from this and it was crazy to me that I could still be triggered in such like a deep, deep, deep way about this. Like I was crying, <laughs> she was crying and my mom's gone to therapy about this. We've talked about it collectively. And so we're both committed to individually going to counseling again and collectively going together. Cause we're like, we want, we don't want this situation that neither of us are responsible for to affect our mother daughter relationship. And, you know, so I think it's a healing journey that I'm going to get to navigate. And I think the cool part about it is I know the trigger, like I know the sensation that I feel when it's about this specific thing. So I know how to address it and be honest and vulnerable with it right away instead of months or years or weeks going down the road of, well, why am I feeling this way? Or what is it? And it's like, part of me, I get shameful because I'm like, why is this the same thing? Aren't we over with this? Like, why is this the same thing that's causing all this turmoil? And then my, I feel like my Christianity, like my faith steps in is like, 
because you're a human and there's grace. And um, so I think the first part, of, my answer to the first part of your question is, I believe it's going to be a forever journey that I'm going to get better at responding to and acknowledging. And I'm actually super grateful that God graces us to go into those deep, 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 painful places. And I know that I'm not alone in that, in that severe pain. Mm. Like when I first started talking about it, I was, I'd grown up in church from when I was like six weeks old until I went to college. And then I took like my five year sabbatical from church where I didn't go to church. (laughs) And so then my roommate, who's actually one of my good friends, um, got involved in AA and she was like, I'm searching for the higher power. And so she was the one who invited me to this random church because she was like, I, th- I found the higher power. I was like, <laughs> okay, great, I'll go with you. And um, that's like where I found myself, where I found Jesus again. Mm-hmm. So uh, if I hadn't uh, been on those church, you know, doorsteps, I don't know like what it would look like if I wasn't, I honestly don't think it would have, I would have been this, I would have had the grace to be as successful and fruitful in my life as I am today, had it been through a different route of spirituality. Mm-hmm. Like I, it's so, because Jesus was such a huge part of the story and a huge, like the Holy Spirit is so amazing, right? Like he reveals things to us so much quicker than like my humans that I could ever acknowledge. And I think the coolest part is the desires of my heart is family. Like the desire of my heart is my family like my immediate family and my holistic family together. And instead of like plucking me out of my family to go create something new, I feel like he's graced me to process this with my family, like Mm -hmm. alongside my family. Even though Mm -hmm. it's super painful, I'm more willing to push through the pain with my family, knowing that we're all going to stick together through this rather than, you know, some, if I wasn't a Christian or if I wasn't, didn't have Jesus as a part of this journey, I feel like I could have been like plucked out and put into a different family in a sense Mm -hmm. and created something new that my family could never provide, which I don't believe. I feel like my family is, has access to the same amount of forgiveness and grace that I do from Jesus. And I get to figure out what that looks like because I want my family to be together. Now there is boundaries. Like I don't see my cousin. My kids have never met my cousin. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't Mm -hmm. do those things together. Mm -hmm. Um, Like my siblings, Mm -hmm. you know, come to my house for holidays and they don't see him. So there are strict boundaries in place Mm -hmm. there. And I don't know if that will forever be the case. And I don't know if God will change, you know, my heart on that. But I feel like to protect the vulnerability of like having little girls um that's our strict boundary so i think mm. if that answers your question mm. a little bit no it answers it a lot and, and <laughs> the, it's connected to my second question which was um the hardest one of the hardest part was um your your fear of what it would do to your family when you spoke up and it sounds like by the grace of god um you've been able to invite your family onto this healing journey with you and you've been able to still experience the family you love together but in a different way so can you touch on how it has changed because you were afraid that maybe it would just fall apart and you wouldn't you wouldn't have family anymore yeah now you have a family that's um, some some or all connected to jesus and your higher power is not just some abstract concept (laughs) but it's personal and powerful and you also yeah. have a spiritual family and yeah. so your love for family actually has been fulfilled even though it's been such a painful process yeah it has it is it is fascinating to see you know like the ephesians three twenty scripture full in place like it's just more than you can ever ask think or imagine and I would say that when I first started processing this with my family and the reactions that I got were so painful, 
I took a step back. Like I probably stayed away from my family for a year to a year and a half. Like I would occasionally talk to them, but I, I was just fully inundated with like my own feelings and my own emotions that I needed to self-protect in a way because I didn't feel like I was being protected. And I knew if I just went back, if I knew that if I engaged with my family in the way that they were engaging with my cousin in that time, I think like the outcome of my life would have been so different. Like I would have continued to be angry at them for that whole time. So I, I pretty much went, I just lived my own life and I went to like my church and I did create something outside of my family until I met my husband and my, uh, we started, we got married and we, five years later, we had kids and all that. And I was like, well, this isn't like, we got to, I got to figure this out because my, the answer isn't you get to walk away from your family. The answer mm-hmm. is for me, and it could be for somebody else, but for me, that wasn't like, so I always felt like something was still missing. Like there's gotta be a way for us to cohesively exist and acknowledge like the pain that is and probably is to come and be willing to stick it out. And I would say my family more than abundantly like rose to the occasion. Like Mm. I've had so many hard conversations with my aunt, our mutual aunt, um, my cousin's aunt and my aunt because, and you know, it gives them all different perspective, right? Because you only have one perspective, which is your perspective until you actually are willing to engage in the difficult conversation. And so like, unfortunately, my cousin's mom passed away. Um, And I remember before she passed away, she was, which is ironic, she was probably, no, she was the most supportive of this. When I told her, she was like, well, if he said he did it, let's do whatever we need to do. And I was shocked. I was like, that's your kid. Like my own mom was like, if you put him in jail, I'm going to go visit him. He's still my nephew. And I was like, oh my gosh. And my other aunt like hired a lawyer to like defend (laughs) him in court. So I just, and not even his mom, but his own mom was like, basically let's just, no, he doesn't deserve to like live, (laughs) you know, like not fully killed, like not obviously. Yeah. But but like what he did, there's a consequence to your action. You, you F up her life. Here's the consequence. Even though you're my son. Right. So it was just like, so like, it was just such a, I was like, I don't, there's just so many things. So I needed to like remove myself for a little bit to like know what I actually wanted and mm. and make a, make a decision from like, make a decision with Jesus and like be led that be led by God of like, how do I approach this? Knowing that I really want to figure out a way for our family to be all together or to have some, you know, to have relationship in a safe you know, loving way. And I think I've been presented with the opportunity, which I often get frustrated with that I get to talk to God a lot about is like, why do I only get to have the hard conversations? Like, why can't my brother or why can't my sister? Um, and I feel like God's always like, because this is this is where what I've called you to do is like bring peace, bring peace to families. And like, like you, you've, I've, like you've been through the unthinkable and you still love your family. And I feel like God's really asked tasked me with like in life to be like, bring holistic healing to families and relationships. And, and I'm like, but like, can I be like the butterfly? Who's like, this is, everything's great. And like, you know, everything's fun. Um, and I remember I relate. <laughs> I I'm like, why are you giving your hardest yeah. battles to this person? You're like, I can't do this. And mm-hmm. and I remember when I was pregnant with my first daughter, we had um someone come pray over her. And I was probably seven months pregnant, and they're like, God's gonna use her to bring peace to the nations. Cause it, she was born right before 2020. She turned one during 2020 when all the racial divide was happening. And I remember, remember him being like, she's bringing, going to bring peace to every nation because there's not one place she can go where she doesn't represent somebody from that nation. Because she's of an American, but she also is Black and she's, you know, Middle Eastern and Japanese and Mexican. So there's not a lot of places that she's going to step foot where she can't 
at least say like, at least be like, I am, I can understand or like I am. And I was like, oh yeah, that brings me like a little bit of joy and that's fine. But I also know that comes with difficult things. And so I think Mm -hmm. having my first daughter is God's way of being like, no, you get to work through this because I've actually called your kid to bring peace to the nations. And if you don't work through this, that like stops the thing that I've asked, I've anointed your daughter to do. Wow. And so it's such like a legacy, like a legacy um, thing that I get to keep in the back of my mind, more so the forefront of my mind when choosing to like pull away or push into because mm. I fully believe that Jesus has brought, has like put us on this earth with too. Obviously you can't heal everyone and you can't do everything, but I want to do what we can to bring that holistic healing to families and relationships. And what's interesting is, you know, we've been in lots of conversations of like the one thing you're not taught in like, you know, the, the school system is like, how do you do friendship? Or like, how do you, how do you, how do you live when you're mad? Or like, how do you, how do you not just go and kill somebody? Or how do you not just go and do the unthinkable? Or how do you not just go and like remove somebody from your life? Like we're not taught that in my experience in the public education system and it's not readily available. So what's been on our hearts as a family is like, how do we lean into this? Like we didn't get dealt this horrible hand of cards to not heal and share our testimony with others, Mm. you know? So it's really easy for, I would say us, it's easier, I think, for us to identify with those who are are in the pain and how to like push through it. And I hope that we're like an inspiration to be like, oh, if they went through like this, like we can get through this, like arguing about who's going to be our next president or like who's going to like like there's no there's nothing that can stop if you want if the desire is to like have reconciliation or have healing like I fully believe that God's in all of like wants that and it just is like equipping myself and those around me of like I'm not I I'm not saying it's going to be easy and I do believe it'll be worth it if it's the desires of your heart Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for sharing your <laughs> testimony. And I'm so grateful to get to hear your story and to get to know you a little bit. And uh, I know you also have an active blog and ministry to help others out of the overflow of healing you've experienced. Yeah. So as I hand it back to Victoria to close out our time, perhaps you'll have an opportunity to share a little bit more about that as well. Yeah. Um right before uh we ask you to share maybe about your blog or anything else um i got chills when you were talking about your daughter and Mm -hmm. the prayer over her life and the anointing like i'm in an ac room so (laughs) i can tell like you know i'm you know there's like goosebumps from you know it being cold right that's how it scientifically happens but when you said that about your daughter i just i got chills and i feel like that's the the spirit in me recognizing the spirit in you and the holy spirit's um, power to be the intercessor and to uh the intercessor between you know us other people and god and um I guess what I'm just trying to verbalize is that you have such a capacity and it's not because, oh, you're Japanese, you're Asian, you know, you're Mexican, like you can get through, we push through that kind of thing. It's because like, of like, God has given you the gift to, of long suffering. That's not a gift, (laughs) but God has given you, God has chosen you because he knows how much your story has the ability to turn evil into good. Like the phrase that comes into my mind is what the enemy meant for evil, he turned into good. And I hate hearing that in my own life too, because I'm like, (laughs) why did we have to go through this evil? Why do we have this struggle of DJ and I are both struggling with bipolar um, 
uh, diagnoses um, and that comes with depression and mania and other things and so like why do we have these struggles <laughs> you know but God is like I didn't give you this evil however I'm giving you the ability to work with it to dig into it so that you are healed so that your family is redeemed and so that future families and other people can be redeemed I mean I, I would hope that that is the vision um, that we can work for. But thank you so much, Midori. And uh, you have a blog, I think, simply Midori something. Yeah, which is so, it, yeah, it's all so funny because there's actually my, there's so much like shame associated that it's called simply Midori because I'm like, can't we rebrand it? Can't we call it something <laughs> else? And my husband's like, no, I, I believe this is the name that God's given us for this blog. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and looking back at every time I said, I'm like, oh, it's just, I'm like, oh, it's so rooted in shame. Like, I don't want, I don't want me to be the name on it. And it's a unique mm -hmm. name. So like, it's not like you, it's not like whatever, like another name, it's Midori. So it's like, mm -hmm. and, and my husband's like, I think you need to work on process or whatever feelings you have about it because it's recognizable. And I'm like, oh, um, but yeah, our blog is called Simply Midori, and we, um, the whole idea and the premise behind it is equipping people to do relationship in a fruitful, healthy way with, you know, open hearts and strict boundaries, which is a hard balance. And, you know, we offer services to process through that and what that looks like. And, you know, we believe that once you can acknowledge something, you can heal it and you can grow from it. Mm. And so, so it's simply Midori.com? Yeah, it's just that. <laughs> simply yeah. I mean, I only read it once, okay? I only read yeah. it once and it's already permanently in my brain. So don't yeah. change it because everyone's going to, yeah, you were right about that. Yeah. yeah, but it does give me like a very overwhelming sense of shame. Like, oh, I shouldn't be like, that shouldn't be <laughs> I shouldn't be name. the center. It shouldn't be, so, it should be someone else's name or a different That comes name. from our Asian background too, where we're like, oh yeah. no, like we can't take on, you know, but yeah. Okay, yeah. well, I hope that um, everybody who's listening, if you um, enjoyed this conversation mm -hmm. or you resonated with it, that you can check out simplymidori.com. Um and check the show notes uh, to get in contact with Midori. Um, thank you so much, Midori, for taking the time. You're about to deliver a baby soon. <laughs> we'll be praying for that. Um, thank you, DJ, for joining this conversation too, um, to be here as a support while we're listening. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Midori. Thank you for listening to the Racing Shame Podcast. Get this episode's show notes at our website, erasingshame.com. Subscribe to the Erasing Shame Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or any podcast app. And please add a rating and review so that we can reach more people with our message of hope and healing.